yeah, the, the next topic was the pseudo Isidorian decretals, which okay. is maybe the most significant. I mean, that alone, it could, there's a lot to say about that. That's maybe the most extensively used of all the Roman collections. This is what um, was, so the Catholic Encyclopedia, it's, it says that, so the false Isidorian decretals is verse to a collection of forged papal letters and other apocryphal documents. They were created around the year 850, and they are said to be um, uh, from St. Isidore or Isidore, who was the Bishop of Seville in Spain from 600 to 636. He's alleged to be the compiler of that collection. And it, so these forged documents claim to be from the early ages of the church and give decretals from popes from the first century to the fourth century. And this forgery greatly promoted the papacy. Um, it had other motives as well to defend the bishops against the secular powers, but the Catholic Encyclopedia admits it must be admitted that the popes benefited by the forgeries, although it says their good faith is beyond question, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia. <laughs> but... Um, we could say that the ready acceptance of the popes of these forgeries cast suspicion upon that statement, that their good faith is beyond question. Um, there's some, yeah, there, there's a lot to say about that as well. So we could go um, further. I mean, in the Council of Florence, we did, the, the Greeks were pressured with a lot of these Isidorian decretals and it's, it's quite well known. In fact, I mean, I, I might like to make another quote from a former Roman Catholic in the 1800s, if that's okay. Sure. Um, yeah, let's see. <clears throat> this was a guy named Folks, F-F-O-U-L-K-E-S. <clears throat> he was saying, he wrote to Cardinal Manning in the 1800s, is it credible that the papacy should have so often appealed to these forgeries for its extended claims? Had it any better authorities, distinctive authorities to fall back upon? Every disputant on the Latin side finds in these forgeries a convincing argument against the Greeks. Quote, to prove this, the universal jurisdiction of the Pope, said Abbot Barlam, himself converted by them from the Greek church to convert his countrymen, one need only look through the decretal epistles of the Roman pontiffs from St. Clement to St. Sylvester. And that's yeah, a quote from Abbot Barlam. Mm -hmm. And in the 25th session of the Council of Florence, the provincial of the Dominicans is ordered to address the Greeks on the rights of the Pope, the Pope being present. Twice he argues from the pseudo, uh, pseudo decretal of St. Anacletus, at another time from a synodal synodical letter of St. Athanasius to Felix, at another time from a letter of Julius to the Easterns, all forgeries. Afterwards, in reply to objections taken by Bessarion, in conference to their authority, apart from the question of their authenticity, his position in another speech is that those decretal epistles of the Pope, being synodical epistles in each case, are entitled to the same authority as the canons themselves. Can we need a further evidence of the weight attached to them on the Latin side? Mm. So Powerful. this is, uh, and there, yeah, there's even more examples. I mean, if, if you're going to look into the acts of the Council of Lords, there's a, they really cited, and maybe it's good to give a few examples of what these. No, Isidorian please do. Yeah, because say. Florence is huge for the whole, you know, East-West divide. So absolutely. Yeah, and it's huge for the, uh, you know, papal consolidation. And that's what's very funny is that um, they use this as scaffolding. So the papacy would not have been possible without these forgeries. Yes. And now that the Pope is, you know, propped up, knows that this this building has been um, you know, built with these forgeries, they're like, oh yeah, we, we can remove these forgeries. Like please they're not in you know they're not important. So the Pope becomes infallible and becomes supreme and so on. The forgeries and then uh over time, you know, oh the Pope is infallible so he doesn't need the forgeries so he can discard them. Uh, I mean is it a scaffolding or is it, or is it a house of cards? Like everything <laughs> right. should be put down. You know, if, if, if these are the things that make the Pope supreme, uh, if if you discard those things, the Pope is no longer supreme. And the Pope himself discards these things that created the papacy. Yeah, they're, they're admitted by the Vatican and all the scholars in that whole ethos to be forgeries. And so, I mean, like at what point do we finally just give this up, you know? Yeah, the the Catholic Encyclopedia makes some really astonishing admissions. I mean, it's it's there's a lot to 
to mention, which it's, it's very presented in the book, but I'll, I'll just mention a few things that um, in the, I'll quote here from the Catholic Encyclopedia from the 1910s. It says, it was only under Leo the Ninth from 1048 to 1054 that they, the false decretals, took full, firm hold at Rome. Um, and, and then we see that um, the, a lot of these canonists, uh, including Gratian, uh, Gregory the Seventh, Anselm, many others, they included these uh, false documents in their collections. And, okay, let's see. I, I made a note about the chef's encyclopedia. Okay, there, yeah, another important thing. So the collection made in Italy under Leo the Ninth in the year 1050 is little more than a compendium of the pseudo Isidoriana. 250 of its 315 chapters are from the forgery. And, and this is just one of many collections. So they entered into all these uh, collections of canons. And so they were, they held sway from around the year 850 till well after 1550. So it, it's a period of 700 years. And even the official edition of the, the Corpus Juris from Rome in 1580, it upheld the genuineness of the false decretals. Um, and oh, it's wow. at the very, the last, the last scholar, uh, yeah, according to, I'll quote from Colton, he's a great Anglican scholar in the 1930s, wrote against Rome. He says, the last scholar to admit a defense of the genuineness of these decretals was the Spanish Benedictine J.S. Aguer, professor of theology at Salamanca and secretary to the Inquisition in Spain, in the seventh dissertation of his Collectio Conciliorum Hispaniae. The book was printed in 1683, and the author was promoted to the Cardinalate in 1686. But no modern Romanist scholar takes his dissertation seriously. So the last scholar to defend them was in 1683, uh, even though they were still cited afterwards by ignorant Roman Catholics who just maybe got them from previous quote mines yeah. that were printed. They just didn't, they just quoted them, appealed to them without being careful. <laughs> Since we're on the um, Council of Florence, uh, something that we might uh, bring up is uh, another forgery. You know, many, oftentimes you will have uh, a Catholic coming at you and say, oh, you know, you accepted the Council of Florence, the patriarch signed. Um, actually, the patriarch was not there at the end. It, it died a little bit before in weird circumstances. Um, but actually, the document that uh, is used is um, is um, a last letter, is will. And and what's very interesting is that this letter, and I'll, I'll let uh, Giorgio go ahead, but this letter is uh, dated from one day after his death. So this letter is signed one day after the death of the guy who supposedly wrote it. Oh yeah, that's the um, that's the testament of Patriarch Joseph at the Council of Florence. Yeah, that that's also something important and worth mentioning, especially since that that's still cited by Roman Catholics, including that um, the Diamond Brothers group, they, in their video on the Council of Florence. <clears throat> so th this is basically, you know, the Patriarch of Constantinople, Joseph II, he died during the Council. He died June 10th, 1439. But it's he was said to have, before his death or on his deathbed, signed a declaration in which he admitted the filioque, purgatory, and papal supremacy, saying, you know, I, apparently he says, um, I acknowledge the Holy Father of Fathers, the Supreme Pontiff and Vicar of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Pope of Rome. Likewise, I acknowledge purgatory. In the affirmation of this, I affix my signature. So it's been shown that this is not his actual but this wasn't written by the patriarch. Yeah, like Sneck mentioned, the date on it is June 11th, even though he died June 10th. So it was, it's obviously he didn't write it after he died. And I mean, it, so, I, I've seen a defense from the scholar Gill where he says, oh, maybe the patriarch didn't know the correct date or something. But there's other evidences too. It was written by someone whose first language was, it appears to have been Latin, not Greek, based on the the way the document is Latinized. Mm -hmm. Like the scholar Froman, the German scholar, he made an extensive investigation into this document. He said, quote, this document is so Latinized and corresponds so little to the opinion expressed by the patriarch several days before that its spuriousness is evident. And that's yeah. 
from a German scholar. Awesome. Yeah, and this is besides the fact that he apparently wrote it beyond the grave. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely it was it was never even cited at the council itself. Well, like, all they, they need is just, they just need an apparition to come and say that this was done, uh, you know, from the grave. So then it would be yeah. Then it would be. A and it's almost, um, it's, it's since we're talking about the lack of Hellenism, um, I want to quote another forgery that's still being used today. Is the creed of Athanasius? So I was about to ask you guys. That, yeah, I have that in my notes. If you have the Athanasian creed mentioned, because. The state of a conscience and the trads all cite this. They don't even know it's a forgery. Yeah. So the Athanasian creed is supposedly from uh, Athanasius. But when you look at it and, you know, all these students that look at it, including Goethe, says, you know, there's no trace of Hellenism there. It's not being quoted anywhere in the East. It's not being quoted by Cyril, who was, you know, um, with uh, huge admiration for Athanasius. It is. Um, it it doesn't correspond to the ideas of Athanasius because Athanasius himself um, um, fought against people who had ideas similar to the Filioque. You know, the Ptomatomachons, the Macedonians. Uh, he calls them pagans <laughs> for for saying that the, the Filioque, as um, um, the spirit, will be subordinated to the sun. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not even quoted during the schism. So if one of the biggest fathers of the East, you know, wrote something that had the Filioque in it. Without doubt, it would have been quoted, you know, um, by the Pope during the schism. The first time it's mentioned, it's uh, it's a 12th century, so it's after the schism. It's to justify the schism that this one is being um, quoted, and this one is still used today. Uh, oftentimes, they will use it uh, instead of the uh, regular creed uh, because you know it's it's a, for them it's a proof, you know, it's very old creed and so on. Um, all the historians are discarding it. Um, and still being used, no problem. And it was normative for centuries after Trent. You know, it, the Catechism of, of the Council of Trent, as you note here, cites the pseudo Isidorian decretals not just once, but 11 times at least. Uh, and yeah. that's very important because if you understand Roman Catholic magisterial dogma, uh, catechisms, when they're approved by the Roman See for the entire church, they actually take on the status of. Uh, universal ordinary magisterium so the, the catechism by definition cannot be erroneous it cannot have errors there might be something that like a typo or something like that but it can't contain dogmatic errors and here we're talking about the foundation of the whole system which is the papacy and the catechism of trent has 11 at least citations of the forged azadorian decretals i mean this is ridiculous so anyway, I, I wanted to stress that because if you're if you're a trad, then you know the importance of the you know Catechism of Trent. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, we could go over that Catechism of Trent. I I was looking at that in the last few weeks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so they they also cite those you know, pseudo Isidorian decretals again. They, they found their way into a lot of um, apologetic materials. Right. So yeah, they cite. Popes Clement the First, Anacletus, Eusebius, Urban the First, Fabian, uh, and Melchiades. So, yeah, you know, one, one example like I had quoted earlier, where it says, "On the primacy of the supreme pontiff, see the third epistle of Anacletus," and that, that's a inauthentic document. But this Pope Anacletus is you know, supposed to have lived around the year eighty, eighty or eighty-one, eighty. Um, yeah, we do have another. False quotation of Saint Cyril in the Catechism of Trent. Um, this one is actually um, not as widely admitted as a forgery, so I've still seen it online and around the internet. So it's saying, um, uh, all right. So page three hundred and nineteen of the Dublin eighteen twenty nine English translation. It's saying. Superior to all these patriarchs is the sovereign pontiff, whom Cyril, Archbishop of Alexandria, denominated in the Council of Ephesus, quote, the father and patriarch of the whole world, end quote. So, and, it, and from the Roman Catechism, you know, this became itself spread and re-quoted elsewhere. And um, I, I'd seen it even, even in the early 1900s in a book called History of Dogmas, this is side. I mean, many people just weren't careful. They just put their trust in the Roman Catechism or the right. Trent Catechism, right. even though it was shown. It's admitted also by uh, scholars that this is 
yeah, the German Roman Catholic scholar Johannes Koisten, he says the 11th homily is uh, nothing more than the 4th, retouched and enlarged between the 7th and the 9th century, uh, as A. Erhard has already shown. So, um, yeah, and, and a lot of these forgeries, sometimes what we'll have is the orth- uh, is that Roman Catholics accuse the Orthodox of of uh, taking out these words of Cyril, of, of taking them out from the manuscripts, or of committing forgeries themselves, but those are also incorrect <laughs> false accusations against us. Right, exactly. 